Order. Order, please. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome all of you to the College of Complexes tonight. Sorry for the delay again in getting set up. It was some traffic troubles, but we're on our way. The format of the college consists of the following. There will first be a brief announcements period, and our speaker will speak tonight. Then there'll be a question and answer period. And remember, what during questions, we ask that you ask a question because at the end of the question period will be our infamous rebuttal period where you will get to say your piece for, depending on how many, from like three to five minutes or thereabouts. My name is Tim. I'm going to be hosting and helping tonight along with Andy Anderson and uh, what are our, the rules? our esteemed sound guy back there. The rules of the college consist are as follows. It's one fool at a time, and no personal attacks. Uh, uh, boo, yeah, no. in other words, I can't, I can't call Charlie a schmuck yeah. without getting in trouble. Where's your time? Uh, I'm from a schmuck. What's the sports good over here? Well, anyway, since Charlie's on the south side, he's a Sox fan, so we'll just leave it at that. But, uh, anyway, all right, I heard we do have a speaker tonight. Rebecca Ratliff is her name. She's from the Citizens Climate Lobby. The Citizens Climate Lobby is a nonprofit, nonpartisan grassroots advocacy organization focused on national politics to address climate change. Their mission statement is our consistently respectful, nonpartisan approach to climate education is designed to create a broad, sustainable foundation for climate action across all geographic regions and political divisions. By building upon shared values rather than partisan divides and empowering the supporters to work in keeping with the concerns of their local communities, we work towards the adoption of fair, effective, and sustainable climate change solutions. In order to generate the political will necessary for the passage of our carbon-free and dividend proposal, we train and support volunteers to build relationships with elected officials, the media, and the local community. Let's give a big round, rousing round of applause for Rebecca Ratliff. Thank you for that great introduction, Tim. Uh, so, yes, I am so excited to be here speaking for you all tonight. I think this is such a cool forum, and would like to tell you about Citizens Climate Lobby. Uh, so we are all about solving the challenge of climate change. And as you said, my name is Rebecca Ratliff. I've been a volunteer with uh, the Northside chapter of Citizens Climate Lobby in Chicago for about a year and a half now. And before we get started, I just wanted to talk about what I assume are probably some common values uh, between what the work that Citizens Climate Lobby is doing and the people who are here tonight. Uh, so we probably all value truths, and the truth is the science tells us a warming climate presents a real risk. Uh, fairness or equity. Um, we know right there, that if we keep going as we are, some of the greatest impacts um, from climate change are going to be felt by those least economically able to adapt. And then um, we want solidarity. We're only going to be able to solve this challenge if we if we all work together. And then we need it to be beneficial for everyone, not just certain populations, certain demographics, or classes. Um, but before I get into the presentation, I want to kind of talk about uh, why I do the work that I do, and maybe encourage you to think about that as well. So I want to read you this quote by the author E.B. White. He famously said, every morning I awake torn between a desire to save the world and an inclination to savor it. This makes it hard to plan the day. But if we forget to savor the world, what possible reason do we have for saving it? In a way, the savoring must come first. So if you are someone who is already passionate about this, or maybe you would like to get more involved, I would encourage you to think about what is something that you savor? What is something that you worry may be irreversibly changed or gone if we continue on this path that we're on? Uh, I've heard some people talk about things uh, as simple as they know that beer or coffee is really going to be changed. Um, 
if if climate change continues and they just can't imagine a world without uh, those pleasures the way we currently have them. Uh, but for me personally, uh, this all changed about a decade ago when I had a child. Honestly, before that, I didn't really think much about the trajectory we were on. I never would have considered myself an environmentalist or anything. Uh, but then I had her, and I realized someone who I love very much is going to be on this planet far longer than I am. And her children, and potentially her grandchildren, will be there far longer. And I have to worry about the type of world we are leaving for them. So that's what made me really want to get involved with this work. And I'm so grateful to Citizens Climate Lobby for uh, giving me something so actionable. So the agenda for tonight is I'm going to talk about what we already know about climate change, the basic scientific consensus on that, uh, who Citizens Climate Lobby is, and the solutions that we support. And then finally, if you like that, what specific actions you can take to support that and make it so we are really maintaining a livable world. And I really want to stress that this is about us. Climate change is a human interest. Uh, we have close to 8 billion people on this planet now. and. Our entire civilization, all of our societies, are based on the assumption of a stable climate. Our climate, due to our actions, is changing more rapidly than ever in human history, and this is really stressing our ability to adapt to that. We're already seeing this with extreme weather events and everything, and so it is in our interest, not just for all these different species and everything, to really stop this when we can. Um, so just, I want to do a quick poll before I get into the science. Um, how many of you would say, like, you really don't know anything about climate science right now? Okay. Um, how many of you would say, you know, you think you know the basics of it? Think you pretty much have it? Okay, cool. Um, and how many of you would say, oh, I, I know everything. I could totally debate a denier. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, right here, yeah. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so, um, you know, I'm not an atmospheric scientist. I know probably not most of us in this room are, but there are things that the scientists agree on, so that's just what I want to talk about tonight. Uh, so, 97% of climate scientists agree that global warming is real that it is caused by greenhouse gases, and that it is human activity that is causing this increase. And the biggest driver is fossil fuels. So you can see on this side of the graph this is saying the million metric tons of carbon that we've been using annually. This starts in 1860, goes all the way up to 2010. Uh, so we started with just coal, then we found gas, and then oil and it has just risen and risen and risen. And I don't want to discount the opportunity, the quality of life, the productivity that fossil fuels have provided for our society. Um, they've given us a lot, but it has gotten to the point where we understand that if we keep using them, and if we keep using them in the way that we have been, we are not going to have a viable world for our future. Um, so that is, that is what we're up against. We need that to start going down and fast. So here is how ex just the very simple explanation of how exactly greenhouse gases are, cha are changing our climate. So when the sun radiates energy that hits our earth and it warms our planet, it warms our planet nicely, it makes it so it's very livable. Uh, however, some of that radiation is supposed to bounce off and go back into the atmosphere that keeps us at this nice, stable place. But with the prevalence of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases that we have been pumping into our atmosphere, that has basically thickened the atmospheric blanket 
and it's just been trapping more and more heat over time. And what scientists tell us is that when they observe how much energy is coming into the Earth and how much is leaving, that should be the same in order to have a stable climate. Uh, but satellites can observe that right now far more energy is coming in than is leaving. It is just getting trapped instead of being able to leave our planet. Um, so we know that more carbon is leading to a warmer planet. And a pretty scary fact is that the 20 warmest years ever on record have occurred during the past 22 years. And if we, <laughs> if we don't do anything, this trend is bound to continue. Uh, now some of us have probably lived in places that experience more uh, moderate or temperate summers, so we have not been subject to uh, this crazy heat, these awful heat waves that a lot of places on our globe have been, but we just have to remember that, you know, weather in a certain place or at a certain time is not indicative of the overall climate. And um, what we have found is that the globe overall, 20 warmest years have been in the past 22 years. So we know that trend is going up. So here's what we're up against. Um, more record setting temperatures, more extreme weather events such as flooding, uh, polar vortexes, uh, heat waves, We've got rising sea levels, uh, which could take out communities, even whole states or countries within enough time. Uh, we have more severe droughts, and we've got increasing ocean temperatures, as well as acidification of our oceans due to the carbon. This is killing off coral reefs, which, is our which are essential to the delicate ecosystems within our oceans. Uh, I also want to mention that the rising sea levels and the really severe droughts we are already experiencing those are causing people, those are forcing people to migrate from their homes that up to this point have always been their homes, they've always been livable, and now these people are essentially climate refugees. That is only going to happen more and more. Uh, and I don't want to spend too much time on this graph, but I just want it to illustrate how much extreme weather events have increased. So. Um, this is only 36 years. And back in 1980, up to 2016, you can see it's triple the amount of extreme weather events there. So it's pretty scary that in that small amount of time, that's how many more we have seen. And it's kind of just the new normal. Now our, we have you know, whole states that are raging with wildfires and cities that are buried underwater and we're just kind of used to it, but none of this should be normal. Can you explain what those colors are? Yeah. Oh yes, sorry about that. Um, so yeah, so the orange here is uh, climatological events like extreme temperature, drought, or wildfire. Um, the, uh, the blue is uh, hydrological events, so water, flooding, or mass movement. Uh, the red is geo geophysical, so earthquakes, volcanic activity. You can see that has stayed stable because, you know, an increase of carbon isn't going to do anything there. Um, and then meteorological events like tropical storms, uh, that's the green. All right, and then if you're wondering what the local effects for Chicago would be, um, we are pretty lucky here. We usually don't have too bad of summers. I know there have been some heat waves in the past, but overall they uh, are pretty temperate. However, uh, we are expected to see the average number of days above 95 degrees anywhere from double to quadruple in the next 5 to 25 years. And then uh, one of the really scary things about this for Chicago is this hotter weather always leads to increases in violent crime. Our politicians are really, really worried about this when they see these projections for the hotter summers in Chicago. And it's also going to lead to more things like polar vortexes, which seems paradoxical, um, but it's actually just one of the, one of the causes of, or 
one of the symptoms of climate change. Uh, so how long do we have to do something about this? <coughs> the uh, International Panel on Climate Change tells us we have 12 years to cut global emissions by about 50%. That seems like kind of an astronomical task, <laughs> but I am here to tell you we have a plan that makes this pretty doable. Uh, all right, another quick poll. Uh, so for how many of you was this mostly new information? Okay, and then how many would say, I've heard most of this before? Okay, cool. <laughs> um, and then I wanna kind of gauge where you are on the action you take on climate change. Uh, how many would say, I haven't heard much about climate change and or I don't think it's much of a problem? Okay. Uh, what about, I think climate change is real and important, but I'm not doing much about it yet. Okay. Uh, what about, I've taken some steps to reduce my carbon footprint, but not much more. Okay. And then, I actively address climate change through my personal choices and by working for a national policy that lowers greenhouse gases. Okay, great, that's fantastic. Um, so I can tell you myself, I was never in that four category until I found Citizens Climate Lobby. Uh, I was definitely doing individual actions, but I didn't really know of an effective national policy, let alone one that any large group of people was working on that could tackle climate change. So you're probably wondering what exactly is Citizen Climate Lobby's solution? But first, I want to talk about what would actually make a good climate solution. So first, it needs to be something that drives large-scale change. Um, so not just for our country, but global. And it needs to do it quickly. Instead, we've got 12 years. Uh, it needs to use incentives that support choice. We are not really interested in making it so people feel like their government is controlling them, taking away all their freedoms. What we want to do is create incentives that make it so people are choosing the things that are going to make a livable planet. It needs to be fair or equitable and sticky. Uh, so sticky meaning this should not be a policy that we're able to pass by the skin of its teeth with you know, a certain set of politicians. And then when those politicians go out of office and a new set comes in, then the policy is revoked. We don't want that to happen. Uh, we want it to be bipartisan so that there's support on both sides of the aisle. And we need it to have enough public support so that even if some politicians were trying to revoke it, uh, they would not be able to. It would be too popular among the people. Uh, I think we saw that happen pretty recently with another public policy. That's what we're going for with our climate solution. And then finally, it needs to be healthy for the planet and the economy. Uh, we, you know, we know that we need something that is going to really tackle this this climate change problem, but at the same time, we cannot tank our economy to do so. That will just, that will never be passed. So what meets these criteria is a carbon fee and dividend policy. I want to tell you guys all about this. So the basis of this is that you start, uh, you charge a fee upstream on fossil fuels, so that's a, the point of refinery or extraction, and that's an annually increasing fee. So pe uh, people and corporations and everyone know carbon is only going to get more and more expensive. Then you return 100% of the net revenue from that fee to households equally as a monthly dividend. And this is not just an idea our group has, it is an actual bill in Congress right now. Uh, this was introduced in the House of Representatives recently. It's H.R. 763. 
and it is called the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. This is a really exciting time for us at Citizens Climate Lobby to be giving presentations right now because uh, we used to be just presenting it as an idea, but now uh, it's an actual bill, it's a policy that could be made into law. And this, uh, these are all the co-sponsors, except this is slightly out of date. I only put this slide in yesterday because I was trying to make sure it had as up-to-date of information as possible, but it is still wrong because we added yet another co-sponsor since yesterday. So. There are currently 11 co-sponsors on it now. Um, one is a Republican. We're hoping to add more um, because we really do want it to be very bipartisan. But that is currently in play in the House. And you can, if you like everything I tell you, you can call your representatives to tell them to support it, tell them to become a co-sponsor on it. And we expect it to be introduced into the Senate soon again as well. So the way this works, like I said, we're putting an annually increasing fee on carbon at the source. We're returning 100% of that equally to the American people as a dividend. And then uh, I talked about how we need this to be something that drives change globally. Uh, we're going to do that by having a border carbon adjustment in place. So if we are doing trade with countries who have an equivalent fee on carbon, then no adjustment needs to be made. We're both on the same playing field. However, if we are trading with a country like China, and they are importing to us, and they have no fee on carbon in their country, then we are going to make them pay more for that, because we understand that's not fair. They, they should have a fee on carbon, just like our citizens do. So this is a way to encourage all of our trading partners to adopt a fee on carbon, uh, which we think will be pretty effective since the US is such a massive trading power. And then there will also be limited regulatory adjustment. This is only applying to the regulations uh, surrounding emissions. So it's not going to apply to anything like particulates, pollution of water, uh, anything like that just regarding emissions because essentially they want to say this is a market-based solution, let's let the market work, let's see how that goes. Uh, so this is, a, this is a bill that is effective um, and I'll get into exactly how effective that's going to be in terms of driving down emissions. It's going to be good for the people, good for the economy, it has bipartisan support, uh, and it's revenue neutral, so it's not growing the size of government. Uh, with the bipartisan support, people told Citizens Climate Lobby, you know, they've told us the whole time, oh, Republicans are never going to back this stuff, they're not going to get behind climate change policies. We never thought that was true. And so we've worked with them the whole time, and they've got behind this plan. Chop steak. So, talking about what exactly it'll do. Uh, for the emissions reduction, we're talking below 2015 levels here. Within 12 years, it's going to reduce our emissions by 40%. So that's pretty on track with what the IPCC says we need to be doing. And then within 30 years, so by 2050, it's going to reduce emissions by 90%. We'll be getting really, really close to that carbon zero state that we are trying to. And then there will be jobs created with this as well. Um, in 10 years, we can expect to see a little over 2 million. 20 years, probably about 2.8 million. And the reason for this is twofold. Uh, you're gonna have, you're gonna see a lot of innovation and a boom of jobs in the green energy sector uh, because people are going to be wanting to transition from carbon and so we're going to be increasing renewables that are available um, and just innovating in other ways. And then also people are going to have those dividend checks coming in so they'll have more money in their pocket. Um, it is a progressive policy because uh, for 70% of the population, they're going to get more back in those dividend checks than they're actually spending in increased cost of living. Um, for the average person, our carbon footprint 
is not all that high. Um, and so it ends up making it so society is incentivized to get a, to transition away from carbon without really hitting the individual consumers. And so just speaking to that dividend, this is what a family of four could expect to see a month after 10 years of this being in place. Uh, and just to be clear, adults are getting full shares. And then if there are children in the household, they get half shares for each child. Uh, and then after 20 years, we expect that to be about 396 a month. Now you notice that didn't, uh, that didn't exactly double, even though it's double the time, because even though the fee on carbon is going up, carbon usage is also going down, which is what we're wanting to see. And of course, we cannot discount the amount of lives that would be saved when we back away from our use of carbon. Um, just from things like dying from heat waves, uh, from asthma, from poisoning the water, all of that. Uh, estimates are 227,000 lives saved over 20 years. Um, so, with all this information, um, I would pose a question to you just to reflect upon as I uh, get into the last part of the presentation here, which is exactly how CCL does our work, how we build the political will. Uh, and that question is, what's the reason I give myself that keeps me from fully engaging around climate change? <laughs> I know uh, for myself, uh, except before I got involved with CCL, it was because I didn't know of an effective solution. I knew it was a problem, and I knew I could take all my individual actions and try and be really good in that regard, uh, but I had no policy to fight for or anything. So that was, that was what was stopping me. Uh, might be different for some of you here, if that is something you care a lot about, uh, but I am hoping that if your reason was the same as mine, then hopefully you will feel compelled by this solution and, and empowered and think, okay, this is actually something I can get behind. So we are all about building the political will. And just a little more about our organization before I get into how we do that. Uh, we're actually international, so a lot of people think we're just in the United States. We're in Canada as well, and we were uh, our Canadian neighbors <coughs> were successful in getting carbon fee and dividend policy implemented recently there. That started January of this year. Uh, they had four provinces that did not yet have a fee on carbon, so um, that is what their prime minister chose to implement, and then we are in a lot of other countries too. And we are nonpartisan or bipartisan. Like I said, we choose to work with everyone, even those who oppose us, because we know that politicians will respond to political will as long as there is enough of it. Because if their constituents prove this is what we want, if they don't do that, we're going to vote them out. Uh, we're nonprofit, so we're volunteer driven. We are solution focused. Um, probably figured out this is the only thing I've been talking about. We are laser focused on getting this Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act passed through Congress into law. And we operate with respect, appreciation, and gratitude, everyone we work with. Um, I am so appreciative of you giving me the space to talk tonight and for the attention and time you've given me. And we, uh, we operate this way with our members of Congress, with others who we work with, because we really think that is going to be the best way to get this policy passed through. And we are very well respected on the Hill for it. Uh, so here is just a graphic of everywhere we are in the U.S. so far. You can see that even in some places where you might not think there's anyone really lobbying for climate change policy, there is. Uh, because we know we need everyone if we want to get this done. Um, so we have a lot of active chapters already and then ones that are in progress of really getting built up. So we've got over 425 and over 100,000 supporters just in the United States. 
Uh, so, one of the tactics that we use for building that political will is grassroots outreach. So that's basically just getting individual citizens to support and back this work, this policy, and you know, talking to their representatives about it. Uh, so we do outreach events such as this one, giving presentations, uh, going to farmers market, doing tabling events, doing film screenings. Uh, there's a lot, and chapters have autonomy over what we choose to do. Uh, but last year, there were over 3,000 of these outreach events across the United States. And then we also engage in a lot of what we just call grass tops outreach. Because politicians don't want to just hear from individual citizens, they also want to hear from prominent local leaders, they want to hear from their churches. They want to hear from maybe other nonprofits who have a lot of lobbying power. Uh, they want to hear from small businesses and large businesses. So we engage and we work to educate all of them throughout our communities so that they will endorse um, the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act as well. And so that our representatives and our politicians can see, okay, there is support for this from all sides. And last year, just in 2018 alone, we got 3,675 endorsements across the country for this policy. <laughs> Uh, and then we also definitely use the media. So we use social media some. We are getting better with that. We have Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. But we do a lot of writing letters to the editor and writing op-eds. Uh, because we know not only do other individuals read this, uh, but politicians read these uh, constantly. They really use letters to the editor to keep their finger on the pulse of what the public is caring about and what people are wanting. And so we send those constantly. And in 2018, we had over 4,100 that were actually published. And a lot of times when people join our chapters, uh, they have maybe never written a letter to the editor before. So we give training on that. We try not to make it daunting. Uh, we have letter writing parties where you can be with other people. You can get feedback. Um, we try and make it really easy for everyone. And then, of course, we lobby. So throughout the year, we try to regularly have uh, in-district visits with our members of Congress. Uh, we have several come in the Chicago area. We have several coming home for their February in-district time, so we're planning to meet with them. But then we also have large national lobby days in D.C. in June and November of every year. Uh, and that is where the Citizens Climate Lobby, they get all of us together from all the states to do a big blitz on the Hill that day. And it's a ton of fun and it's really wonderful because you just see how many other people are working toward the exact same goal with you. And you see, okay, this is going to work. Uh, so in 2018, we had about 1,400 meetings with members of Congress or their staff. And so if you find this really interesting, our next lobby day this year is going to be June 9th through 11th. And uh, if you, if you are really liking this solution that I presented. If you just want to get more information, see how you could get involved. We have uh, weekly info sessions on Wednesdays at 7. Uh, you should have all gotten a brochure. If you haven't, just, you know, Rose probably has some more here. Um, she can give you one, but you should have that address on your brochure. And I do apologize, they're a little bit older, so they don't have the energyinnovationapp.org website on there. But that's where you would want to go to get more specific information about the bill that's now in play. Uh, it's also where, uh, if anyone is a prominent member of the community, or uh, a business or anything, they could endorse it there. Or if you're just a citizen wanting to write to your representative about your support for it, that site will link you to that too. Um, all right, so that is everything I have for you. Um, I would love if you want to discuss any of these questions um, or just 
Can you point out your questions okay. at me? Andy, can we? Uh, Hi. All right. We need a moderator. Can you point out? Okay. I think he was first. All right. Yeah. I have a question. Um, okay. Recently, I I heard that um, that electric car value is going up while while uh, oil burning cars is going down. So I was wondering, uh, do you does your organization? Um, a deal with uh, GM or any car companies to try and uh, push electric cars or fuel cell cars or whatever? Uh, we are not currently doing any of that. We All of our work is around actually getting that fee on carbon, and we know that what once that's in place, the market will respond okay. accordingly. What's going to power this climate change? I mean, what's going to power the world based on your climate change a bill um, once we transition away from carbon right I mean how are you, how are you gonna my question is is I, I've got a I'll, I'll explain it in the rebuttals but I've got a view that you know we're gonna have to include some components of nuclear to do it are you for all like all renewables or for yeah. some other things yeah so um citizens climate lobby is um, it, we're basically we're for all renewables. Um, when it comes to nuclear, we are agnostic about that. If that needs to be a part of the energy mix, um, that is uh, that is not what is driving climate change, and right. so we would be happy to get away from that. Okay. Um, well, uh, t t t ten thousand years ago, this whole Midwest was under glaciers. How could you say fossil fuels caused? Cause that I don't believe that what I'm saying, but I'm asking this question. How, how, how did fossil fuel cause this glaciers in the whole Midwest under ice? Chicago, Illinois. Yes. Um, I think he's asking since, they, since this whole area was glaciarized. How can you say that all the if, if I'm correct? Yeah. How all the release of carbon has caused such a catastrophe in the last uh, ten thousand years ago. Um, I don't think I can speak to that. Okay. Well, well it's, it's yes. Okay. It is HR seven sixty three. Who is the sponsor? Who is the red sponsor? Um. So a couple of the sponsors off the top of my head are uh, Ted Deutsch and Francis Rooney. They were some of the main sponsors, uh, but I do not have the names of all of them memorized. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, Rebecca, right. I use some natural gas. I and my two little cats, so we don't freeze in the winter. Isn't that? Are we going to get taxed? Is there going to be a tax on our using uh, this carbon stuff? So natural gas would be one of the things that was subject to a fee. Yes, um, and like I said, it's at the um, it's upstream. So once it gets to the point of the consumer, um, it's it's not a direct hit. But yeah, that would be subject to it. Surely, why would you need natural gas when you get a lot of hot air anyway? Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the answer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. <laughs> Do you have like a I mean, I guess the the idea sounds good, but I'd like to see like a model of how this really is going to work. Um, I mean, it, it kind of sounds abstract, and the idea that Republicans are going to agree to it um, seems kind of dubious to me. You know, they say they would, right? But um, they they did not do so this week. You know, the last few weeks. Um, I heard that they didn't have any interest in cap and trade or whatever these people they were calling. So. Yeah. Um, so uh, to answer the first part of that, I absolutely understand wanting to see um, more detailed information. Uh, shortly after Citizens Climate Lobby was founded, uh, we commissioned an economics report for it because we wanted to see if the policy would do what we hoped, and if it did not, we would you know, they would tweak it. Um, that was called the Remy Report. 
and that um, is available for anyone to download and read at cclusa.org if you're interested in, in getting into the more granular details of it. But yeah, um, and then uh, to your other concern of not enough Republicans getting on board, it's really just about building the political will. We have found that they are much um, so they are much more open to this policy uh, due to the fact that it is revenue neutral, due to the fact that the dividend received among the people is equal. Um, and there are also uh, there's another conservative group uh, lobbying for a very similar bill. Uh, ours is the one that actually, got put up in the House of Representatives, but so there's conservative support behind this idea of carbon fee and then dividend. Okay. Yes. Um, how, how do you plan to address, you said a few minutes ago that uh, politicians respond to the will of the people. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a massive number of politicians that are supported mm -hmm. by uh, fossil fuel billionaires that they are de actively denying the will of the people when 80%, 90% of the country wants something done, these guys are paid to deny it. What do we do about them in Congress mm -hmm. other than it takes time to vote these people out? Is there something else, other different way, way to pressure them uh, other than just voting? Here, here. Yeah, no. <laughs> it is it is a problem, all of the money from the fossil fuel industry. Um, but yeah, I would say voting them out is the most effective thing. Uh, but if I, I think the problem right now is that the reason they have been so willing to take money from um, these fossil fuel industries is because most of the politicians who who take a lot they are in areas in which they do think they do not think that will upset their constituents. Um, if you if you compare it with Democrats, I know some of them do still take money from uh, oil, but it's a much much smaller amount because they know that will probably upset their constituents. So if they if they see that that is going to be a problem, I think that will get lesser and lesser, um, and then we can also vote them out too. That doesn't change. Yes. Uh, yeah, as a member of the Evanston chapter of the Citizens Climate Lobby, I have one commitment that maybe you can address. I'm very strongly in support of this carbon tax, but I go along with the thinking in the Green New Deal about using the dividends instead for the uh, renewable energy and for uh, climate change mitigation. So the question is, how are we going to get together? with the Green New Deal and enact the policy so that the dividends itself might be addressed in some issues uh, mitigating climate change and uh, the environmental improvements. I mean, this is a big stumbling block in a linkage between the two organizations. Yeah, so um, there's definitely been a lot of press and energy around the Green New Deal. Uh, we're really proud of our bill because it is an actual policy, actual legislation that could be enacted, whereas the Green New Deal is more of an idea and it's a non-binding referendum. It's essentially our politicians saying that we know that we need to take action, uh, whereas this would be action that would go into place. Uh, as far as um, kind of changing it to where it would maybe uh, be more attractive to proponents of the Green New Deal. There are no plans to do that uh, because we are we are firm with our strategy of giving the, uh, giving the money back as dividends um, makes it a more moderate solution and it also makes it progressive. Unfortunately, uh, while you know, I personally wouldn't have a problem with the money being used for maybe some of these other things, it could make it so uh, those of us who were the poorest in society were more, were more hard hit uh, by the increased costs, whereas the dividend going back to them protects them. Uh, yes? Uh, Representative Ocasio Cortez says in 12 years the world will end because of climate change. What do you think about that? Yes, she did. I got, I got it. What was the question? I said, uh, Ocasio-Cortez say, says, because of climate change, the world will end in 12 years. In other words, she, she said, is that true? What, what do you think of that? Oh, no, no, I would not say that is true. Um, <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, um, it, unfortunately, if we do not take some type of action within 12 years, and that does not mean wait 11 and then take action, um, if we do not do that now, uh, our world will likely experience the worst effects of climate change, and we're going to experience a lot of areas becoming rather unlivable. Um, our world is going to go on, it just will not be nearly as pleasant as it is right now. Uh, I see a question over there. Okay. I'm sorry, what was that? Could you repeat the question? Yeah, she said it won't end. Yeah. And also, please don't, um, you know, for yeah. anyone interested in what exactly was said there, I, I would suggest um, reading the latest IPCC report, which is uh, very long, but uh, there are just some parts of it that uh, are, are more uh, digestible than others. Um, so, yeah, don't just take what I'm saying for it. Rebecca, um, when does the Northside chapter meet? When, when, when are the meetings? Um, so yeah, if anyone is interested in uh, the monthly meetings for CCO, we have both a North and a South Side chapter, just depending on what area you're in. And it's every second Saturday of the month at uh, 11 a.m. Um, any other questions before rebuttal? Um, I think he did. Yeah, the uh, current president and the GOP have eliminated 78 essential U.S. federal government regulations concerning the environment. Does that concern the citizens' time of having it? Absolutely. That's it? Yes, I mean, I'm very concerned. Share my right? concern. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very concerned by it. Um, what we are focused on, though, uh, there are a lot of great organizations uh, doing really targeted work to try and get those regulations back in place or to keep more of them from being eliminated. Um, and they are doing a fantastic job with that. Uh, we are laser focused on getting this policy in place, though. Um, and did you have a question? Okay. okay. Uh, yes. Repeat the website. Uh, the website is cclusa.org. Yes. Is it your carbon tax a flat tax? Um, so it's going to be. So the fee would start at fifteen dollars per metric ton, and it would increase by ten dollars per ton annually. It, did that answer your question? Well, I guess. Okay. Yeah. When, when was the, the bulk of this presentation prepared? Like last month? Uh, so how long have you been using this presentation with the current numbers that are in it? Um, it was, well, so the current numbers are based the current numbers are based off of the um, the model, uh, the the economic model. So we but, but, uh, well, which model though? I mean, there are uh, new numbers come out every few months from the scientists around the world talking about how much time. Yeah. Yeah. So um, those numbers, so the you know the 12 years, the 50 percent uh, reductions needed estimate, that all came from the IPCC report that was released, I believe, the day after. Thanksgiving. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. In the last midterm election, the state of Washington, the efforts, a green state, the effort to enact a carbon tax failed to propose. Had we learned something from that fiasco so that we did have a better strategy in the next time? And also, what about the claims that the Thank carbon you. sequestration technology is going to make the notion of a carbon tax? Unnecessary. Uh, to your first question about Washington's failure with 1631, I think we did learn something from that. We learned that oil, gas, and coal companies 
are incredibly scared by the idea of a fee on carbon because they know how effective it will be at us transitioning to renewables and other solutions. And second, we learned that if the money is not being returned as a dividend and instead if it is invested into um, other green projects, uh, it is not as attractive. And then, um, I'm sorry, uh, the other question was surrounding... Well, there are different claims, which I don't necessarily accept myself, that the new technologies which oh, will carbon, sequester, sequester carbon will yes. make uh, the tax issue uh, necessary. Uh, How do we rebut that? I don't accept that myself. Uh, yes, I would say uh, that there, yeah, I would say that we want to stop the use of carbon it, as opposed to just focusing on vacuuming it up. Anything else? I, 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 so I think somebody had asked where the meetings are for the North Side chapter. Oh, sorry, where they are. Um, the meetings for the North Side chapter are at 656 West Berry Avenue at Second the Second Unitarian Church. Church. You know. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Let's welcome. Let's thank our speaker. Thank our speaker. You will get the last word. And you will get the last word. So if you want to make any notes about the type of rebuttals people give and address those at the end, that's their usual format here. So you get the last word for sure to address some of the some of the questions that will come up in rebuttal. Okay, um, How many I'm assuming wanna there's a few people that want to give a rebuttal here tonight or add something to it. So please hold up your hands and keep them up so I can get an accurate count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and anybody in the back? Okay, uh, we'll assume there's going to be about a dozen. So. Uh, we'll go with four minutes apiece, everybody. So, who wants to be the first rebutter up here? Come on up. Uh, the on deck circle is by the rail over there, just like in baseball. We have an on deck circle, and it's on the outside of that rail, not standing here in the way of where the waitress walks through. Walk through here. Uh, don't clog up this hall hallway here. And get to the outside. All right. You got here first. You guys are trying to get the speaking order going. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, I've been focusing on this whole climate change thing. Before you were born. Let's uh, give our speaker the chance to let be heard, please. Okay. Just, just look on the web. The cost of climate change. Okay, so you make some money into an auto oil. Uh, you don't see anything right now, but there's something called hurricanes that happen in the fall. A number of years ago, Andrew was the biggest hurricane. It was near Seattle, near Miami, $17 billion. The newer hurricanes, the ones in uh, around Florida, are over $100 billion. We have to pay for this. All along the East Coast is rising sea levels. We're, we're going to have to live differently. Unless you want to build boats, it's going to be a different world. And you're good. It's going to cost a lot of money. And there's an another way to do it is this particular program here. Hey, 
It's going to cost money. Let's pay for it and maybe get money back. Set going. Floor one for CCL. Okay. Well, first of all, we live in the capital society. Yay! And the, and the capital society, what, um, what drives capitalism is profit. Yay! And anything that takes away from profit, they'll go against. You have the Koch brothers, they have about $80 billion invested in fossil fuels. That's where, where the most of their money comes from. And they're, and they're fracking in Canada at this time, and they're trying to uh, make um, another 80 billions by fracking in Canada. We have two countries, basically, that are working to uh, solve this problem. One is China, and the other one is Germany. China does not have a capital system. It has a hybrid system moving into socialism. And it, it produces more solar panels than every other country combined. And it's looking forward to have an ecological <coughs> society. And what they mean by that, do away with all fossil fuels, move to solar, move to um, hydropower, and to wind power. And they're thinking of increasing their solar panels to double in about five or six years. So they're really going ahead of that, uh, uh, ahead on that, and they're trying to solve this problem. Another country is Germany. <laughs> Germany has a very powerful union, union society. In other words, the unions are very powerful there, and that's what pushes progress. In the United States, they tried to bust the unions since especially the Reagan era, about 1980 or so. So we have very few people belonging to unions. That's one of the reasons there's no power on the other side. Another thing, all of history shows that unless you have a lot of people that are demonstrating against what we have now, getting out in the street and having a general strike. And what the general strike would do is take uh, profits away from the corporations. And if they don't make profits, they might do something about it. It's, a, it's the biggest incentive that we have, is putting people on the street and having a general strike, have marches, have different people making speeches in the street wherever they can, and so forth and so on. But the only way to make progress is by people's power. People have to get out there and be cognizant of what is happening and do something about it. So Sid, you said the cook was it was eighty billion dollars? Okay. This last thing. Well as a uh, as a member of the Evanston chapter of Citizens Climate Body, I did first of all extend an invitation to Rebecca to explore a joint meeting between our two chapters so that we could learn where to use it. I also mentioned some things about the Green New Deal, which I think is going to be a people's movement and the necessity to have a collaboration uh, on this issue of a carbon tax. Uh, the dividend issue, might, there might be some conflict over. But I think that there, it is in our interest for these groups to work together on this climate change mitigation. I personally feel that the uh, carbon tax is a very important thing. And it came up in a very interesting context yesterday at Northwestern University. I went to a uh, Department of Chemistry colloquium, which was given by a very fine chemical engineer from the University of Wisconsin, who was talking about some of the new technologies to improve the uh, efficiency of the, uh, some of these fossil fuel processes. And I did raise the question there about 
the transition away from uh, fossil fuels to carbon neutral renewables. And I don't think my question was dealt with very uh, friendly. The point was that if we make if we do this, we have to sacrifice our standard of living. I disagree with that premise, but I have to be respectful to the uh, speaker. Now, when I was in the washroom, I ran into one of the physics professors, uh, Professor Garge, and I was telling him about what I heard, and what he res responded was, well, we're not going to get anywhere until we have a carbon tax. So I knew that this notion of a carbon tax has made some impact. Uh, but his fee was uh, $10 a, uh, a, a ton rather than the, the fee you have here. Um, the carbon sequestration issue, I think we have to, I don't think it's going to work at all, except for certain areas where we still might be able to get away with fossil fuels. But it's being used, I think, as a uh, device to uh, maintain the use of the fossil fuel paradigms. The other thing, and I brought this up with the Sierra Club, uh, and I'm also on the Air and Energy Committee there, and I do think that we have to oppose not only uh, fossil fuel uses, but hydrocarbons and petroleum in our manufacturing process. Okay. We have a uh, asphalt plant on the southwest side of Chicago, which is going to be petroleum-based and introduce, I believe, a lot of uh, impurities in the atmosphere and in the water. So I think, and I know on a global basis, uh, petroleum is widely used and we have to find alternatives for uh, use of uh, petroleum in manufacturing. That's a uh, virgin field and there hasn't been enough attention accrued to that because we can use as much petroleum in manufacturing as we can for fossil fuels. Just look at the problem of the, of the uh, plastics, which is uh, approached on our water supply as an example. We have to keep all these fossil fuel these petroleum in the ground and not use more methane or uh, natural gas because of its adverse impact on, uh, uh, on the climate. So these are some issues. I, I, I should also mention that our chapter is going to meet with uh, Congresswoman Schakowsky in, in this month uh, uh, to get some support from her. But uh, I was up in front of her office on Monday with the protests from the 350.org and the Sunrise to get support for the Green New Deal. And we met with her staff member, and the congresswoman has uh, voiced support for the Green New Deal. So I do think that we're going to be more effective bringing these together. The carbon tax is a wonderful idea. But I have uh, a deep love and affection now for Ocasio-Cortez and Senator Markey for this Green New Deal. We have to, and we have to bring the scientific community together because we don't have the materials now to supplant the asphalt, which also traps heat when it's used. So and it's like uh, melting the ice in the Arctic and we don't uh, reflect the infrared radiation into spaces instead of it. So we have to work together. I don't think the fossil fuel interests are going to go away, and unless we have these vast citizens' movement, science movement, and people's advocate movement, we're going to condemn our descendants, including my son, to an inhospitable future in a climate which is not sustainable for humanity or other life. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Richard Graver, and I'm uh, representing today the International Logic Party. I, I, along with my colleagues here, uh, who are all coal founders. Um, first off, I do not, I do not have any rebuttal or argument with your <laughs> beautiful presentation. Uh, however, I do have or take issue with your delivery of what you want to accomplish by going to the same politicians that are just driven by their money and their bread. You will never take away their way of life, their mode of living, their modus operandi. The political party that we are trying to preach can elect Bob or Sue over there. You who are here obviously care about the world, the environment, 
about your children's future, your grandchildren's future, and that's what we're here to try to ensure and protect. Okay. I'm going to read you something written in my ideological profile now. In order to reduce the impact of our society on the environment and to enhance the stability of both our society and the environment, we must make immediate efforts to switch the vast majority of our energy infrastructure, at least at the civilian, to sources of energy that are not destructive to the environment. In the short term, this means relying more on renewable sources of energy, such as solar, wind, tidal, geothermal, and nuclear fission when safety can be ensured. In the long term, this means developing nuclear fusion technology for a practically unlimited source of energy. The first method towards achieving these goals should be for placing additional costs on all pollution and energy production, such as a carbon tax. The second method towards achieving these goals should be through government financing of research and sustainable sources of energy, such as nuclear fusion, the third method towards achieving these goals should be through removing any incentive for continued use of renewable, of non-renewable energy sources. The fourth method of achieving these goals should be to incentive, incentivize the restraining of workers from fields in non-sustainable energy to fields in sustainable energy. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for that excellent presentation. I would also like to share with you an idea in my ideological profile. In order to reduce the impact of our society on the environment and to enhance the stability of both our society and the environment, we must make immediate efforts to switch the vast majority of our energy infrastructure, at least civilian, to sources of energy that are not destructive to the environment. In the, short run, in the short term, this means relying more on renewable sources of energy, such as solar, wind, tidal, geothermal, and nuclear fission, when safety can be ensured. In the long term, this means developing nuclear fusion technology for a practically unlimited source of energy. The first method towards achieving these goals should be through placing additional costs on all pollution from energy production, such as a carbon tax. The second method towards achieving these goals should be through government financing of research and sustainable sources of energy, such as nuclear fusion. The third method towards achieving these goals should be through removing any incentive for continued use of non-renewable energy sources. The fourth method of achieving these goals should be to incentivize the retraining of workers from fields in non-sustainable energy to fields in sustainable energy. I'm Vicki Elberfeld, and I too support this idea in my own ideological profile. At this particular point in time, this idea is in second place on the ideological dominance index of the International Logic Party, which nominates political candidates based on what the most strongly supported ideas are among its members. Now, we need you to also support this idea in your ideological profile. I also ask you to support this idea in your ideological profiles. I also ask you to support this idea in your ideological profile if you do so care to write one. That, like an echo. <laughs> that's how efficient, intelligent democracy works. But if you have a better idea, <laughs> then please come to our meetings and let us hear your idea. And if it really is better, then we will be happy to support your idea. And the very next meeting is in Skokie tomorrow at 1 p.m. at Howard and Lincoln at TBK Restaurant. So hope to see many of you there. All right. Thank you for your time, everybody. Well, and real quick, just to throw that in there, I want to remind you, 5 p.m. before the College of Complexes, right here, we're meeting to make democracy convenient for you. If you don't want to travel out to these locations, just come to the meeting that we're having right here. Okay. Next. All right. Thank you.
If I go to you, okay. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm going to speak incoherently, but uh, it was it was great to come here today, and I of course agree that that uh, policy changes are very important in dealing with climate change. Um, but I also think we have to deal with the the most the most often repeated. Um, uh, opponents to doing something about climate change, which is it's going to hurt the economy. Um, so I, I believe uh, renewables are getting more and more viable, but we need to keep working on that. So that's really the reason I came here. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about um, starting a project to get to get more renewables uh, on, um, on apartment buildings and people's houses and things like that, um, and and my my pitch is if the more that people do that, the less defensible the the uh, the bad effects on the economy will will be to those uh, opponents to doing something about climate change. So so um, I'm, I'm just asking you if anybody's interested in working with me on this idea or at least talking about it further, uh, I'll, I'll be around here. Um, I'm interested in hearing all of your ideas. Thank you. Okay. Who's next? Who's next? <laughs> Hi, I'm Ellen Corley. Um, thank you very much for your talk. That was excellent. Uh, really, it's great to see uh, graphs and uh, you know a real argument and a policy. Uh, I particularly, you know, my concern, as I said, was uh, I kind of do a lot of research on. The deep state, uh, the really the reactionary counter intelligence, counter revolutionary forces that we don't even see. Uh, the ones that are backing um, a lot of our politicians really are working for. You know, you wonder why war, you know, uh, forever war in the Middle East or um, the you know arms and um, oil and. I, I just have noticed that they seem to be prevailing. Um, ever since I I was born in '55, I, I think you know this Cold War. It's been a steady progress ever since the end of the war, and actually before that, I, these people have been funding wars really since I think probably 1918. You know, um, war, and they've got. You know, plants all over the world, the Middle East. The, I've traced them to the Illuminati, Rothschild, you know, bankers, and they really are real. They have a lot of power that we that is not representative. It's almost like policy uh, is, you know, it's kind of a game. You know, it that we feel like we're represented by politicians, but we're really not. So um, that's why I feel like we've got to, I've spent a lot of time trying to expose them and outlaw them. You know, um, they are fascists, basically, and, uh, you know, but we don't know they're there. And uh, they control the media, they suppress any, they either will kill somebody if they start to oppose them or start to make a lot of noise about them. Uh, and. You know, like they did Martin Luther King or Malcolm X or John F. Kennedy or Kennedy. Um, you know, so, you know, I just, I, I think it's a great issue, especially with the statistics, but it, I think we, we really have to regulate. I think a, a, the one way we could do it is if our Justice Department wasn't so captured and corrupt and our EPA and our um, every regulatory agency we have has been captured by these guys. That's why you kind of got what you have now. Um, I think whatever policies you put in, they could just turn it on around. Um, 
you know, they've pretty much done it. Uh, they, they just, you know, look, they just disbanded the whole, you know, Department of Interior. They're putting every one of the Supreme Court justices, uh, Barr is going in, or, or you know, he, um, he worked with Nixon, Cohn, uh, you know, Roy Cohn. I mean, these guys, Kavanaugh, they're all Federalist Society that were every single judge being put in, every single decision is designed to benefit corporations, supply side, and screw the demand side. Basically, and the, you know, the demand side has no power, no influence. Uh, you know, if we could, I try to get us all together and agreeing, this is the problem here. You know, we've got some Nazis up there, and we've got to really organize. Uh, there's right now a Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, proposal being put out by like the 72 ticket. smartest investigative journalists, David Talbot, who started the Salon. And, you know, they're all we're all writing about the same thing. You know, Alan Dulles worked with Hitler, set of intelligence, and he worked with Carl Schmidt, the Hitler's jurist. And they really are real, and they really are controlling. We're just puppets. We might as well be. You know, the Shah of Iran running our country. We don't have, you know, we can scream all about them. They'll just start shooting us. They're already in place to do it. Um, and capitalism is definitely the problem. Marx described it perfectly. Uh, you know, um, but because of the media and the education, none of us even understand what you know about Marx. I think I always love hearing what you say about it. Um, actually, we're, we're working together with a... Um, interfaith coalition against for criminal justice reform and for peace um it's going to be at my church next on saturday at st chris's Dumb's, like 1400 north dearborn and i do think if we could get coalitions of churches they've got the jewish the muslim the catholic the um a lot of unitarians and episcopalians if we could all just agree on truth, you know, what is really going on? They are evil, we want good, let's get rid of them. But uh, it's not as simple as economics because actually, you know, neoliberal, like free market economics, I mean, nobody understands it and um, it doesn't really motivate people. They've got us pretty much, you know, sitting at home, getting fat and watching TV, uh, you know, it's just going to be hard to motivate unless we really make up law, you know. So anyhow, let's let's hope at some point, I'm hoping for a great awakening like they had in the 1700s. And I, we, do, we have to get rid of the corrupt people and the liars and the deceivers and the propagandists and, um, you know, you put in a bunch of real representative Shoot good people and start talking openly about it. Shoot Maybe right? we've got a chance. But I, I love that 12-year deadline. I think it will make a difference. I would like co a little more accurate picture of after 12 years, is it too late anyhow? I think a lot of people just think it's not going to work. Uh, you know, let's just get ready, you know, to die, you know. But um, and I have to say, I, I, you guys talk about your logic party. I Somehow it sounds like logic, not, I don't know, something's missing. I think I'd like to look back to history and figure out like socialism, uh, you know, something that's more grounded in reality. Sorry. What's missing is you at our meetings. <laughs> Thank you. All right. <laughs> Next. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, it was interesting to see a uh, group that was for climate change, but was not exactly an environmental group. Uh, and that was interesting. Um, I had a recent environmental experience where uh, with the rain and then the f deep, quick freeze we had here, we had ice on everything where we lived. And we never put down salt because of what it does to the, to the plants, to the edge of the, you know, to the dogs. And, but we did this time because of the ice and how pervasive it was and how we had to live with it and how dangerous it was for us, and, and the ice ate into our steps, and now I have another problem. I mean, the uh, salt added, ate into our steps. But it got me thinking of salt, and I'm guess, as an observation, I'm guessing that uh, after the interstates went in, 
the uh, use of salt on roads became really prominent. And I was also realized that when I see a puddle outside in a really cold winter night, anything below like 28, let's say, and I see a puddle of water, I realize that pu now I realize that puddle is a puddle of salt water. And it's really very cold water. It's not like water. It's like below, tw it's, it's 28 degrees. And it's liquid, all right? So I'm sorry for all the kids who are going out to bars who have these little shoes on, who put their feet in that water, and it's just below 20. Oh my God, what do you live with? But then I was also thinking of the birds and the other animals who see this puddle of water and who go there for a drink, and they're drinking this salt water. And then I realized, of course, that it's not good for them. But then I also realized that that's probably the hardest thing they have to do in the winter, is find water. Because everything is either frozen or it can't get to, you know? And it's like, they have a hard time. Um, the other thing that was I didn't understand about the talk today was it sounded so much like um, the cigarette tax. It's like, we're going to tax cigarettes and people are not going to use them. And it's like, and then we're going to put the tax, and then we're going to put that money to work doing whatever it was. I don't think that worked out exactly as planned, but you also see, like, and I know you've mentioned it, that as the use of fossil fuels go down, the payback will go down, even though we're charging more in this balance that someone had figured out. But I just couldn't formulate the question, and it was like, you know, I hope you address, like, this sounds like it's cigarette tax. I'm not sure of the mechanics of it. And the other thing that all brought to mind was, and I, decades ago, I read a book called The Overworked American, and it was written by this MIT economist who had married an Indian from India. And the Indian said to her, you don't realize how you, how you are li living, okay? And basically what it was is, and this was the premise of the overworked American, okay? You have, in the 50s, okay, the average home was maybe 900 square feet, maybe 1,100 square feet, all right? And at 1,100 square feet, one wage earner could pay the taxes, pay the electric, pay the heating, cover the expenses for 1,100 square feet of home for a family of four, two adults and two kids. I grew up in an 1,100 square foot home with a family of five, with one bathroom, and to this day, I don't know how we all got out of the house on the same on, on time, but it, that, it worked, okay? Now, suddenly in the 80s, the average home was like 2,200 square feet, all right? 2,200 square feet is more taxes, more heating, more furniture, all right, more of everything that one wage earner can't support. Suddenly you have the overworked American. Suddenly the ladies have to go to work because dad can't bring it all home, okay? And when you ask about communism, socialism, all these other isms, basically, as Pogo said in the 60s, I've identified the problem and the problem is us. Okay? We are simply consumers, and we simply have to stop it, all right? Um, do all of us have to have a BMI that's over 25, all right? And then you ask yourself, well, let's do something for the environment. Let's cut the use of, like, uh, drugs in, in, uh, in, in, in animals, all right? And it's like, yeah, but the reason drugs are in animals is because they get better production, they get heavier, quicker, and stay healthier, and you get cheaper food. And that's why we do it. So you can have cheaper food. And it's like, yeah, but do we all have to have BMIs over 25? Are we not the problem? You know? It's like, pay a little more for 
um, organic food, and you're like, I don't want to pay more. And I'm like telling you that you have to eat so much. All right? And then I'm a fine example. All right? But the thing is, we are indeed the problem. And I'm happy you are right that as a society, we have to act in a focused manner <laughs> as you're proposing. All right? But indeed, we are the problem. Um, Thank you. All right. Yeah, I agree about everything that's said over here. I noticed those charts you had with the 1950, all those uh, fossil fuel going up economically. One thing we failed to mention, the main problem we had with this is people. That same chart, 1950, I think we had 2 billion people. Tonight, in 1960 sometime, I remember listening to the Johnny Carson show, he's been watching many, many times. It was said that two out of three people that wanted better hunger every night. Isn't that a shame? But it's just that we just had constantly had a growth of people population. It is everywhere around the world. Everybody wants to advance economically. It requires more and more energy, more of this, more of that. And, and it's just the cause of the problem. And he mentioned about animals can't find water. Animals can't find where to live. They can't migrate. They can't. They're being smothered out everywhere all around the world. They're being slaughtered. They're just being dying because they can't they can't move anywhere. Uh, the problem is, is, is basically population, and uh, I think they're going to find some way to get the religious people, uh, the governments, everybody to really concentrate on help reducing, at least stabilizing it, and then you know try to increase our economy from there. All right. Okay, we're in the same How's everybody doing tonight? Thank you. That's great. Um, I wanted to say that the presentation was awesome. It was attentive as far as catching everybody, um, grasping everybody's attention, and that's one of the keys as far as engaging people in what's being said. So um, I just wanted to say that um, I'm also a CCL volunteer member and I've been uh, an environmentalist for a very long time and, and part of the reason, like Rebecca said, is because when my son was born a long time ago, he's now, you know, he's, he's not a baby anymore. That was my impetus to get involved because I, I saw him growing up and I said, I'm not gonna just stand by the sidelines and do nothing about what's going on. It's just not natural to see everything that's going on. It's um, very unnatural to produce the amount of waste and pollution. It's not natural. And so um, I hope everybody can be a part of the solution because I, I do feel that if we're not, um, I'm more of a pessimist and I do feel that time is right, it's, it's right there behind us that we need to do something about it. about climate change. Yes, I believe in it. Yes, I do believe it was man-made. But the question is, what are we going to do about it? And my friends, don't believe the scam of renewable power being an alternative to powering ourselves out of this mess. Populations are going down. When you get a prosperous economy, kids become an expense rather than a source of labor or a source of retirement. So they, so they tend to go down. It costs more today to raise a kid in, in an advanced industrial society in the United States than ever did back in third world countries. So development is good. The question is, how are we going to proceed with that development? Fusion is always 20 years away. Always 20 years away. But I found something out maybe about seven or eight years ago that can be an alternative solution. Many of you know already know what I'm going to be talking about tonight. But it is a 
fusion reactor called the liquid fluoride thorium reactor. How many years away? Charlie, they ran one in 1960 at Oak Ridge for well over 6,000 hours and has been well documented in government research. All you got to do is go to Kirk Sorensen's website and you'll see a ton of PDFs, a ton of files, and a ton of test results already there. The problem was the Nixon administration in 1973 canceled the project in lieu of the, some of the advanced reactors that just don't plain work. I then, I took this on with somewhat trepidation knowing that how much radical the solution was, small, dispersed modular reactors of a liquid variety. You can figure this stuff out easily by just looking it up on the web. Uh, Google thorium reactors. Particularly look up a gal who was in seventh grade who explained it so well she got a well, well of a million plus hits and wound up being a keynote at one of the Thorium Energy Alliance conventions. My own personal story is this. I I'm concerned about the climate. I am also concerned about energy. But I also know too that they provide an advanced industrial society with the power to need a lot of power. It costs, it takes power to recycle. And to do advanced recycling, it takes even more power. And if the world's gonna develop and get electric power, it's gonna even require more power. You're not gonna get that through coal. You're not gonna get that through renewables because of their intermittent nature and the amount of scale and the amount of land and other usage it's going to take. It may get cheaper. They do have a place. Solar panels on homes is a good thing. But remember, too, that there is an environmental cost because they are made with some real nasty stuff. Yeah. Now, the reason I am so supportive of the Thorium Energy Alliance and these small modular reactors is that they do provide a solution. And it would be a more of a commercial one. Right now, there are four companies, one in the United States, three based in Canada, that are starting to get designs online and are taking investment capital. There's also 600 people in China working on this very thing. And those 600 scientists are under the guidance of the last president's son, who's working on them. For me, this, as Richard Martin says, this thorium revolution in nuclear power is inevitable. The genie's out of the bottle. Whether we Americans decide to innovate or not, if we don't, we're going to be licensing it from the Chinese. Oh, and haven't we had enough made with China already? Mm -hmm. Just imagine our monopoly. And the thing was, we invested heavily in this stuff in the 60s, and the Department of Energy is now working with them hand in hand to get these reactors going. For me, our best bet would be to put a little bit of, not much, but a little bit of government money into getting a functional reactor run. They're not that expensive, and they're not your grandfather's nuclear reactor. They're small. Up a room this size could power the entire north side of the city. At the end of 30 years, you'd have about a basketball size of waste. You'd sequester it for about 400 years. The advanced nucleotides could provide medical science with medical isotopes. And there's just a ton of advantages to it. Now, I know you might think that I'm a little bit mad. What about the radiation hazard? Yeah, I admit there is some, but I think that it would be a price well paid to have a much cleaner air, a much cleaner environment, and for those of you guys who think about fusion, we'll put it like this. Fission is the new fusion. Why don't you Google Fukushima? I have, Charlie. <laughs> That's old 1970s design with a 300 year Reactor. Okay, so um, yeah, that's where you move to. Uh, first, uh, a response to one of the uh, rebuttal, rebutters. Um, he was uh, comparing uh, carbon taxes to uh, taxes on cigarettes. Uh, with uh, the whole uh, uh, movement towards taxing uh, the coke, it came out, they talked the advantages of taxing cigarettes. It doesn't really reduce smoking, but the big benefit for taxing cigarettes that, uh, that I read was that it it decreases the number of kids that start smoking. So that, that was the advantage I found. So not sure 
but that's worth the conversation, but I thought I'd bring it up. A um, couple of actual rebuttals. I really liked the talk, but there are a couple of points that I take issue with. The first is uh, um, the term uh, climate change. Um, we've all heard the, uh, uh, the phrases created by the right, like um, the death tax or uh, activist judges. Uh, when, they, uh, when scientists started coming out with all the data on global warming, all the conservatives got together, put their heads together, did some uh, study groups, and found out that climate change is a much more subdued phrase. Change is better than global warming. Warming, warming is much more scary. So um, my first complaint is your name. <laughs> so I would recommend you take that back to your group and consider getting something that's more accurate and is uh, more appropriately scary, uh, like global warming. Uh, the second issue is you uh, had mentioned that you really weren't concerned about um, uh, the nuclear issue because you're really focused more on climate change. And what I would say, what I would say is that uh, if you're not concern concerned about the nuclear uh, people using nuclear or governments using nuclear to try to reduce climate change and they start doing that you're just trading one poison for another it, it it's I think it's imperative to put that into uh, if you really care about the future is to make sure that they don't try to sneak in more nuclear power plants uh, it's not cost effective it's like literally five six billion bucks to make one nuclear plant, um, and the other thing that really bugs me is that what industry can you name that's been in business for 50 years and doesn't have a plan to deal with their industrial waste, besides the nuclear industry? What they do is they just keep it on site, and if they close the power plant, the nuclear waste is still there, because they haven't figured out a way to deal with this. It is literally a poison for 100,000 years. That's why you recycle it. And, and so you, there is no, you don't recycle. That's a myth. You don't like magically make it undangerous. So those are my two complaints um, for what they're worth. And then finally, I think that I, I, there's an image I like to give people. Somebody came up here and said, we, we got to deal with it or else we'll have people in boats. And that is like the wrong image to have about climate change, OK? Rising waters is not going to force people into boats. You have most of the world population is on the coasts. All that population is on the coasts. And if you think that's not going to create a problem, all you have to do is think of what's happening right now in Syria. You have, an, you have a, a mass migration of people who can't live where they are now. And look at the problems just in Syria, displacing millions of people and all the problems it's creating around the world. Imagine that happening to all the cities, all the coastal cities around the world. You're going to have mass migration. They're not going to have any money to replace all this infrastructure at the same time. It's going to create huge problems politically. And those, kind of, those are the kind of problems that allow dictators to come in and start blaming people. we got to get rid of these people because it's all their fault. And then you start having mass chaos. This is not about we need to build enough boats. It's not. It's about avoiding um, a mass migration that will push the earth into total chaos. Thank you. I'll take the next one. Are you ready to go? Yeah. Okay, come on up. All right, she's ready to go. <laughs> Um, I don't even have time to think about all of the starts that the that governments and the nuclear industry have made to use nuclear waste up to reprocess it to reprocess it and to produce more electricity from nuclear waste. There's Barnwell, there's Manchu in Japan, there's God knows what in Russia. There are two or three projects in the United States that have been abandoned. And it's a filthy process. It produces more and more 
dangerous isotopes. Um, people really don't know how much money has been spent and um, derelict um, nuclear reactors sitting out there with nothing to do because they have tried to reprocess nuclear waste. Um, nuclear waste is a whole other subject. I wanted to talk about the fact that nuclear is not carbon free. Now, you've got to know that windmills use a lot of concrete. So they produce poisons and it takes a lot of carbon to produce the concrete to go into a windmill. The point is that the amount of electricity per kilowatt hour produced by um, windmill uh, compensates for that uh, for that carbon. And as the man somebody said that um, solar panels use a lot of really noxious chemicals. So far, most of that poison has been very conveniently shoved onto young, Jap uh, young Chinese women who make the solar panels, and they get sick and we never hear about it. But solar panels really are important, and um, the problem is that they're being manufactured without protecting the, young, the mostly young women who produce them. And that would add to the cost, but it would certainly be worth it. Um, so I wanted to go into carbon that is um, used by the nuclear industry. There's the mine. And digging the mine and uh, digging out the, uh, the uranium not only produces a tremendous amount of carbon, but it also poisons the miners who are not warned and are, do not understand the kind of dangerous job they have. Then the uranium has to be milled, so there's a tremendous amount of um, uh, industry in milling the uranium and uh, it, that's also a filthy process that um, they put the tailings in ponds and uh, one of the, the biggest nuclear accident in the United States, um, Church Rock, was an example where the mine tailings were in a pool and the dam broke and Church Rock is, uh, among people who know, Church Rock is called America's Chernobyl because there is more poison. The, pro the, the reason we don't hear about it is it's because only the Native Americans were the ones that were living out there, and so who gives a damn? There's a tremendous amount of carbon produced when a nuclear power plant is decommissioned. It has to be torn apart, and, um, and so you get big machines out there, and it, there's a tremendous amount of carbon in there. Then. Um, most of the debris from a decommissioned power plant is hauled away, mostly to Utah, and this haul away requires the manufacture of trucks, and the trucks go back and forth, uh, and the emissions are enormous because there's thousands of trucks going back and forth, for example, from Zion, Illinois to Clyde, Utah, and uh, that's a really big <coughs> carbon thing. Um, then, okay. Um, so the, the last problem is the storage of the waste itself, which somebody else has brought up. And at Nuclear Energy Information Service and NEIS and the other uh, anti-nuclear um, organizations that I espouse uh, recommend HOSS hardened on-site storage because the trucks that would be, re these storage things are huge. They're totally out of scale to the human body. They're enormous. And to haul them over to Texas uh, requires special trucks. And, um, the, and so the solution to it is to keep them on-site, buried 
um, put them inside a bunker and try to protect them from terrorism. Sorry for taking so long. Oh, all right, Andy, you're gonna. All right, I'll go after you, Charlie. All right. The uh, let's thank our speaker, Sam Rose, for setting this up, and other representatives of the CCL for setting up here. Thank you for your extensive PowerPoint here. Um, I'll be eclectic as usual here. Uh, yeah, thank the other organizations for coming here, NEIS, um, yeah, for giving us information on the uh, nuclear thing. I'll be eclectic, as I say, as usual, until about an hour ago. I really hadn't really thought or studied or read anything about a carbon tax outside of the one among countries. Um, internally, uh, my own initial thing is it sounds like a flat tax, um, or in, as they also call it, and I know nothing about taxation, they also call it a value-added tax, which is common in other countries. We don't have it in the United States, in which a tax is added at the point of production, and that's why it sounds like. The only thing is about this taxation is is that I and my two cats will be paying a rate of taxation that rich people will be paying. Just so my cats and I don't freeze. I don't want to see them freeze to death. So I guess I have to pay this tax. But the same tax is paid by people who have, uh, have opulent wealth. Just put some on your house, right? Charlie. What is that? Just put solar panels on your roof. Oh, we'll get to that. I'm getting there. By the way, all right, I'll talk to you about it, friend. You're supposed to be the great Toastmaster here. That's so you right. get up here and you tell us at one point in time that there's less population in the world, and then about 10 minutes, then a few, a minute later, you tell us we need more energy. Why do I need more energy if the population of the Earth is going down? It, I don't need any. No, I'm sorry. No, you're no. misinterpreting me, Charlie. Yes, well, you don't contradict internal contradictions within the There was no internal contradiction. Are, are not avoid you misquoted me. The other is the government in the United States, you can't get venture capital because nobody will give it to you. So now you're coming to the government of the United States to fund your loony, loony, loony. Oh, this is a oh, great. Technology is a solution to global warming. Right. That's all we need is some kind of technology. Technology like they did in Fukushima, Japan, which is now unoccupied. You know, how many people live in Fukushima, Japan today? Zero. Nobody. That, now, who wants to, who, who, I'll tell you what, do you want a reactor in your town? I would. You want one in your neighborhood? Guess what, folks, let the word get out. Experimental, it's experimental. It is not finalized. And the other thing, another internal contradiction. He says the design is, is finished in 1960. It was and then one he that informs was us that there's 600 engineers working on the design. Well, which is it, man? That's what I mean. Let's get our facts. I'll tell you what, if I was a guy with money, I'd say, listen, one of them, I'll think about it. We'll see. I'll, I'll call you sometime. Because he gave me two things in here. The other thing about this cost, this carbon tax, the, car, the fuel industry is just going to pass it on. There's an enormous amount of money here. I don't think it's any discomfort to them. I don't know about the economics of the industry, some things, but on the scale that they're working, Exxon and Mobil and things like that, I don't think this is any deterrence into their corporate wealth ambitions here. The other thing is, I'd recommend it, being a socialist, is if you want to advocate something, I say we nationalize these industries, as the United States has done in the past. They nationalized the railroads in World War I. Pretty, came pretty close to doing it in World War II. They nationalized industries in basically in one sense or another in World War II. Uh, that's my approach. It's time to set, her, set around doing it. You know, uh, let's see. 
And in final conclusion, though, I think we have to be, and this is something we should do at the college here, and she ended her program in a very positive note, we should have respect and appreciation and gratitude. That's what I ask of you. Thank you very much. <laughs> respect. That applies both ways. Charlie. And gratitude. Say thank you, Charles. Well, gratitude that you're now off the stand. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Charles. To all that came tonight, I hope you enjoyed uh, the various different pieces of rebuttal uh, beyond our excellent presentation by, forget, I'm sorry, uh, through Rebecca? Yeah. Rebecca. Um, I'd like to make a few quick points. Uh, Charlie made one of them for me earlier. There's, um, this is a free speech forum, but I, I give speeches. I give speeches. I've been giving talks here since it went non-smoking a few years back. I'm allergic to cigarette smoke. So uh, I've been giving talks about three times a year on various blacked out subjects since 2007. And since 2007, we had a massive amount of heckling then when you try to talk about three specific subjects that are universally blacked out by the American media. And those three subjects are wending their way up through the courts. There's massive lawsuits against three different types of organizations. And uh, the fourth one that's blacked out, I'm not sure, are you all you aware that the 214 edition of Censor News, the number one censored blacked out story listed in the top 25 in 2014 was climate change. Yeah. <sighs> Hold on, give me a sec here. Um, Have you avoided? <laughs> um, a, a few quick observations. In 2014, as I said, the number one story was, blacked out story was climate change. This book gives you the top 25 game changers that would change America overnight if they were covered rather than intentionally suppressed by the media. Huh. Were all of you from uh, the climate change movement aware of Censor News? That that book comes out every year that has, it's, it's it translated into like 13 languages all over the world. It's a nationwide bestseller, totally blacked out by the media because it has stories in it, like the story that finally broke with Boston about the pedophile priest, Spotlight. They made a movie out of it. Anybody ever see that movie? It describes how knowledge moves forward and when, when people pass through a barrier and learn something, they can't go back. Uh, currently, the, the United States press has been blacking out. It's not, not an a, a accident that they're missing it. They're blacking it out. They do not make the connection between extreme weather, flooding in New Orleans, Houston. They don't make the connection between that between that and climate change, right? Not from what I heard. And um, I agree totally with Tim. Some of you might find this shocking. I agree with Tim that our future is nuclear power. But we somebody was talking about developing fusion reactors. We already have a giant fusion reactor out there. And the energy is shipped to us in the form of clean light. There's no pollution. There's three numbers you should recognize. Memorize three numbers. One of them is 10,000 to one. 10,000 times more light falls on us in energy every day than what the human race uses. We collect one ten thousandth of it. We don't need any coal, oil, gas, or nukes. And also the second thing is, before the first thorium plant gets online, or uh, a few dozen of them, the, the fight to keep climate change becoming irreversible will be over. We need to, uh, the, the Green New Deal and many others around the world are calling for a World War II type of mobilization. Yeah. Like taking a time out. Uh, our, our grandfather's father took a time out in 1941. People took a time out from college. They enlisted in the military, they went into factories, women went to work. We had essentially full employment. And it was a four year time out to build billions of tons of everything to solve the problem. Right? And that my, my one uh, suggestion would be 
try to update the current and the numbers in this presentation tonight were a little out of date. Uh, many scientists are saying we've, we've got the new pictures in the last month or so of more and more ice melting in Greenland and at the poles. At the rate, rate the ice is melting, they're thinking we have less than 12 years. We, uh, they're talking about getting off of at least 50, 60 percent or more of fossil fuel by 2025 if we're going to stand any chance of keeping the climate rise under what's needed to prevent the ice from just melting and going into the ocean. Once that, once you get enough clear water in the North Pole, the, the water absorbs the heat where the ice used to reflect it back into space. So we're, we're close to the tipping point in a number of years. It, it, it's maximum, the tipping point where it becomes irreversible is 2030 at the latest. A lot of scientists think it's less than that now. And so uh, they're calling for the minimum of a mobilization where you have basically full employment. <coughs> Everybody taking a time out from their life and going into whatever is necessary to build billions and billions of solar panels, wind machines. Incidentally, you know, the public in Illinois is not yet aware that solar panels, solar energy is cheaper than fossil fuel anywhere on the planet now and vastly cheaper than any kind of nuclear power plant you can build. So just on cost alone, the future belongs to solar and wind power. Uh, the, uh, the last thing I would say, the, the, the company that's uh, putting up solar uh, for no money down is a company called Sunrock, but there are probably others. But you get a no money down, they come out and install the system, and you just pay the same electric bill you pay you lease to buy because the panels are so cheap. Uh, the, uh, I coach science at South Middle School in Arlington Heights, and we've converted the garage uh, to a solar teaching center. A man just parks his car in his garage, electric car, charges right off the roof. And that's cheaper than buying the electricity from ComEd now. So the other thing is um, Professor Griffin uh, has written 12 books on 9-11. On and the myth that was sold to us. See, the heckling starts when you mention the forensic evidence on 9-11. We're going to be talking about heckling. We'll, we'll take a time out when the heckling starts next week to, to give you the forensic evidence, the database. Uh, people used to get heckled when they said inhaling asbestos dust was a health hazard. Now, if you, if, you, you, if you deny that forensic evidence database, you don't look like you have a contrary opinion. You just look stupid. And, and, and people are maintaining themselves in a bubble of mythology on different subjects. Some, uh, some are paid to do it, like our congressmen. Others don't want to think about it. A lot of people don't want to think about climate change. But for the future of the kids. The last thing I would ask you, is everybody familiar here with a, a, a name Greta Thunberg, Swedish girl? Do you know? Yeah. She, is, she is currently becoming as famous as Martin Luther King, or Albert Einstein, or John F. Kennedy. I have some flyers. Stay home, don't go to school. Anybody that wants one, uh, pass these out. Are you giving those out to your high school? What? Are you giving those out to those high school kids? Every Telling them to skip school? No, that's not me. Are you saying what you're advocating? Uh, see, uh, here's, here's a sense of how the heckling goes. Charles is not, not facing reality at all. The, 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 the strike, the, listen, heads up, people, heads up. Listen to this. The strike for school, school strike for climate is not my idea. It's not my opinion. It's being driven by hundreds of thousands of students nationwide that woke up and said, what am I doing in school? It's my time, Charlie. What am I doing in school if I have no future? This is what our young people are faced with, and it's happening all over the world. Well, that's because uh, you're in the Why are you here instead of school? I'm with the global world. So uh, ne next week we'll uh, we'll show you how to deal with that. Uh, there's a, as Greta Thunberg said, uh, she's got uh, TED Talks. If you, have you watched any, have you seen those TED Talks? It's inspirational, isn't it? Greta Thunberg is one of the most inspirational speakers on the planet right now. And she's giving speeches at the UN, uh, TED Talks, world leaders, and she's, she just turned 16. 
So there, and um, there's just do a Google search for Greta Thun, or the sweetest girl on stage. Yeah, I will. It's like it all. And, and, and just all right. help yourself learn, so you'll be able to get like up to the, on the same game. page with the rest of us. That's how knowledge moves I'm forward. It's been blacked out by the media. It spreads from person to person talking. The only way you can learn about it, a lot of the stuff we're going to be talking about next week, the only way you can learn about it is from hearing about it from a person talking why about it or giving you join a this organization? Oh, I, I, I probably will, but I didn't know about well, it. Why doesn't Greta? What? Why doesn't Greta join CCL? Well, why don't you ask her, Charlie? Charlie, Charlie, Charlie don't, don't, don't heckle school. me, Charlie. Write a letter to Greta. Charlie, he's talking. Okay. Um, all right, so our, that, that's about it for tonight. Uh, our speaker we, needs to go to get the last the word. Rebuttal. So uh, our speaker gets the last word. Uh, come on up and address some of these. Right you get the last word. And All right, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. About how much time do I have for closing remarks? Actually, we go till about. Uh, okay. <laughs> actually, about seven minutes. Okay. Uh, when she gets through talking, we, we have to move to the back, and if you're going to visit and exchange information, go over to the other lobby. You know, the restaurant closes at nine, but they want us out of this room by quarter to nine. Roughly. Okay, let's. Thank you. About seven minutes, you got. All right, so um, again, thank you so much for your attention and for uh, your thoughts regarding carbon fee and dividend and just a lot of the issues that our planet is facing right now. Uh, there are a couple, I don't believe I'm going to be able to address everything, but there are a couple things I heard that I did want to speak to. Um, one, one main thing was just the fact that we are in a capitalist society and everything is so profit driven. And that is exactly the reason why um, placing a fee on carbon is going to be so effective uh, because once you make it, so companies are now going to, it's going to be a lot more expensive for them to keep using carbon for their energy, for them to keep using uh, trucks that are fueled by gas as opposed to electric, things like that. They are going to move to other other sources of energy, whether that is nuclear, whether that is renewables, I'm not sure, but it's not going to be these fossil fuels anymore because it will no longer be profitable. I would also say to anyone who is uh, optimistic that we are going, that either other countries or ourselves is going to be able to just do this kind of organically with uh, more solar panels or whatever, um, I would say that I would love to see that. That would be really, really wonderful if we just started uh, building up our renewables. Uh, but I say put your money where your mouth is. If you are so sure that we are moving away from fossil fuels, then it shouldn't be any problem to put a fee on those fossil fuels because that shouldn't really put any kind of dent in our economy. Uh, and then we're giving money back to the people, so that's helpful as well. Uh, so that is what I say for anyone who is thinking, we, we're just doing it anyway, then I see no problem with putting it beyond that. Uh, and then uh, people compare this to the cigarette tax. I would say that our reliance on carbon is eerily similar to how our country felt about cigarettes for a long time. It was pervasive throughout our country. In 1950, 50% of Americans smoked. And they smoked everywhere. And we just thought it was fine. We just thought it was a good thing. Um, so not only was it ubiquitous, but it was terrible for our health. Now, when we realized how terrible for our health it was, and we wanted Americans to change that, we understood that because we were so addicted to it, we could not simply tell people this is bad for your health. We know that carbon is bad for our planet. It's bad for our air, it's bad for our, wa our water, and it is causing global warming. Um, but that knowledge alone is not enough. 
we have to make it expensive in order to make it so we get off of our reliance on carbon. Since 1950, when 50% of Americans smoked, we are now at less than 20% of Americans smoking. So making something very expensive does work. There's still going to be a small amount of use, but it goes way down, especially when there are other options. People um, smoke have a mental disease. <laughs> they do. And, you can't yeah. take away their mental disease. Literally. Yeah. Um, and then really? there, there was a lot of um, really? there was a lot of discussion around nuclear and thorium. Um, as a representative of CCL in this situation, I cannot speak okay. to uh, you know whether uh, to any right. opinions around nuclear, uh, but I would just say the market will find other solutions when we get off carbon. Uh, and that's a good thing because we already know all of the detrimental effects of that. If you want to know my per my personal opinions on nuclear thorium, I'm happy to tell you that otherwise. Uh, but we are about uh, we are about driving the market in a direction away from carbon because we know that is what is hurting us so badly right now. Uh, and then just finally, I. I heard a lot of fear um, and just, you know, a, a lot of worry around the state that our planet is going in. And that's very understandable. I'm very afraid. Uh, I plan to be here at least 50 more years or so. Um, and like I said, children will be here longer. Um, and I am a bit worried about that. but. I have found that solutions and actions are the antidote to fear. And I would hope that tonight uh, you find this solution compelling enough that perhaps you walk away and you're a little bit less afraid about where our country is going to be going, knowing that we are fighting for this and that you could help fight for it. Um, and also, there was just a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, pessimism as well uh, and I want to leave you with a quote one of my favorite quotes by Alex Steffen that I think about whenever things are feeling really hard and that is that optimism is a political act those who benefit from the status quo are perfectly happy for us to think that nothing is going to get better in fact these days cynicism is obedience and I decided that I was done being cynical and I was done being obedient a long time ago. I hope you will too. Get out of the cell, Andy. Get out of the cell. Thank you. One final note that our speaker just mentioned that sweetest girl said we don't need more uh, speeches about hope, we need action. When you get action, when people get involved and take action, then you get hope for all the solutions. So she's absolutely right. Thank you. And we are. Adjourn. We're out for adjourn for tonight and please come next week. Thank you.